Thank you. I'm also going to talk to you about linguistic context, but from a very different perspective. I'm a speech language pathologist, so my main area of research is how communication changes with aging and with age-related communication disorders. But since my affiliation with the Defining Wisdom Project, I became interested in how communication changes affect how the speaker is perceived by listeners. And so I'm going to tell you about work from uh, two projects that, of several that we've done over the past few years. I'm just going to show you some of the data from that um, on that question. So this project stems from an interest in understanding the paradox that um, aging involves gains in experience and knowledge, but that these gains are offset by general declines in cognition that affect the ability to retrieve or convey that knowledge. And, and these changes, amongst other changes with aging, give rise to both positive and negative stereotypes. So one of the um, cognitive domains that changes with aging is language. And that's relevant here because language is one of the primary means by which wisdom is conveyed. So our working hypothesis of the way that uh, wisdom is perceived in the wild or in the real world, um, and this is very much like a couple of the past um, researchers were talking about, very much a context-dependent uh, conceptualization of wisdom. So our working hypothesis was that the communication changes that come with advancing age affect how the the speaker, how old the speaker is perceived to be, and this triggers age-related stereotypes, and those in turn affect whether or not the speaker is perceived to be wise. And then there are other factors that contribute that involve characteristics of who is listening and uh, whether and what type of stereotypes are triggered in that person. So our approach to this hypothesis was to test speakers ranging from young adulthood to older adulthood, um, and they produced narratives in response to several prompts that we gathered from previous research. Two of them were hypothetical scenarios, and the third one was an autobiographical narrative that talked about a turning point. And then we transcribed those narratives, and we measured, um, we coded them in multiple linguistic dimensions, and from those, we selected 12 that um, represented different constructs and uh, were at different levels of analysis. So uh, aspects of speech, word retrieval, the ability to form formulate sentences, um, discourse production, semantic content, and the use of figurative language. Then we operationalized wisdom as a combination of five dimensions, including knowledge, perceptiveness, consideration of alternative solutions, sensitivity to others' feelings, and the ability to communicate effectively. And uh, this is not a model of wisdom, but uh, we think of these factors as uh, Howard and Judith have talked about as more precursors to wisdom or antecedents to, to wisdom. Then we had raters, both young adult and older adult raters, uh, listen to the recorded narratives and rate the speakers on these five wisdom dimensions. We also asked them to estimate how old and how educated do you think the speakers are. So after we did this study, we realized we wanted to compare the kinds of age-related cues that are available in spoken speech to those that are available in written language. So we replicated the experiment, but this time we had the raters read the transcribed narratives. They were transcribed verbatim and judge the speakers on that basis. So the first question was, uh, how does communication affect age and how do those changes affect the perceived age of the speakers? So to address this, we did parallel regression analyses with our 12 communication variables as the predictors and either age or perceived age as the outcome variable. So these are the things that actually changed with age. The older the speakers were, the less precise their articulation was, the less specific their vocabulary, 
They produce longer and slower narratives with a, a lower proportion of relevant words. And there was a, so the uh, width of the arrows here represents the strength of the relationship and the dotted lines indicate trends towards significance. These are the variables that affected age perceptions among the listeners. So again, we see the less articulatory, uh, less precise articulation, longer narratives, slower narratives, and fewer relevant words um, were judged to come from older speakers. These are the factors that affected age as perceived by those who read the transcripts. Um, lower rate of speech, oh, I missed one. Uh, well, it'll come up again. So lower rate of speech was the main one that affected how um, old the, the readers perceived the speakers to be. So here are all the data together. And um, I want to point out a couple of things. First, there's a fair amount of overlap between those characteristics that actually changed with age and those that were used by the raters to perceive age. So they were, they were fairly accurate. The second thing is that um, the, the, these communicative variables were much more predictive of perceived age for the listeners as they were for the readers. The, um, they accounted for about twice the variance in the, in the models for the listener as the model for the readers. The one factor that I neglected to mention was the use of metaphors that affected, it didn't change with age, but it affected um, how age was perceived by both the listeners and the readers, although fewer metaphors were perceived to come from older speakers. Now this is something that we followed up in a later study that I don't have time to tell you about, but if you want to ask me about it, I can tell you a little bit about it. So I'm going to skip this. So the next question was then, how do these age-related cues affect ratings of wisdom of the speakers? Well, the first thing we noticed was that ratings by the listeners were higher than ratings by the by the readers, those who read the transcripts. And this was true across all of the wisdom dimensions, but especially for the communication dimension. And we think this is probably because people who are reading language have higher expectations of communicative competence than those who are listening to language. So the real question then is, what is the relationship between the speaker's age and the ratings of wisdom? This Jackson Pollock of a graph shows that there's no clear relationship or suggests that there's no clear, at least no clear linear relationship between age and, and rated wisdom. So then the next question was, what are the communication characteristics that are affecting ratings of wisdom? So again, we did regression analyses using our communication predictors, and this time the outcome variables were wisdom ratings by the listeners and by the readers. So for the listeners, the only significant factors were how long the narratives were and how precisely the speakers articulated. Those were the two factors that affected how wise the speakers were perceived to be. For the readers, Again, longer narratives and narratives that included a higher proportion of relevant words were ju judged to come from wiser speakers. So here are those data together. And what I, we noted here was that for both the listener raters and the reader raters, there were two main factors that affected their wisdom judgments. One of those factors created a, an advantage for older adults. So older adults produced longer narratives, and longer narratives were judged to come from wiser speakers. And the other factor, either articulatory precision or relevance, created an age disadvantage for the speakers. So we think this trade-off is what's behind the lack of a relationship between speaker age in, in this contextualized task and wisdom ratings. There's another reason, too, 
when we did the analysis by dividing our speakers into three groups, as shown here, and we included gender in the model, we found that there was a nonlinear relationship between speaker age and wisdom ratings, and it was different. The relationship was different for men and women. So specifically for men, perceived wisdom seems to peak in this middle age period between 50 and 70 years of age. For women, wisdom perceptions peaked in young adulthood, 30 to 50, or younger adulthood, 30 to 50, and seem to rebound a little bit in the oldest age group, 70 to 90. So something to look forward to, I guess. And this pattern was found for both the listener ratings and the reader ratings. So my conclusion, nothing is ever simple. I do have some uh, take home messages that um, So we did find that language competence changes with age across a variety of dimensions, primarily showing decline. Perceptions of age were highly accurate, especially given age cues. Judgments of the speaker depended on fairly superficial aspects of communication, like how long they spoke and how precisely they spoke. And those aspects conferred age advantages and disadvantages that traded off against each other. And these judgments were also influenced by speaker's age and gender, and I, although I haven't shown you this data, by listener's age and gender, by the specific narrative, and by the specific rating dimension. So hence the conclusion, nothing is ever simple. So those conclusions are represented in, in this uh, model that we started out with, including some of the factors that uh, we've also included all right, I just want to thank uh, the funding sources and my collaborators and all the people who've worked on this project. Thank you. Hi there, thank you for that. I really enjoyed your talk. Uh, I was a little surprised to see that there was such a strong link between length of the narrative and wisdom ratings. Um, just because in my own experience, just because someone's talking longer, they're more verbose, I don't necessarily, or I don't think that I perceive them necessarily to be more wise. And I'm wondering if, if you have some ideas about why that might have been the case. Did you find that people who had longer narratives maybe were uh, appreciating different perspectives? And so it took longer, for example, to, to kind of you know, to, to, to talk, or maybe they were uh, kind of appreciating the ambiguities uh, of sort of, you know, the different issues or something like that. Uh, well, we do have one of our questions, which is the, uh, the ability to consider alternative solutions, and um, we haven't looked specifically at whether or not that was particularly affected more than the other dimensions by the, by the length of the narratives. But the other thing I should say is that there are many different ways of measuring length, and the one we actually used was number of propositions. And this is actually a word level measure, so it's a pretty basic measure. Um, but the idea behind it is that it, it um, represents number of ideas and not strictly a word count. So I don't know if maybe that's one of the reasons why um, people who produced more ideas were perceived to be wiser. But I, I do think it's telling about the limitations of, of one's ability to judge wisdom in the moment and the kinds of things they rely on. Yeah. Thank you. So, thank you very much. I really enjoyed your talk coming from a very different uh, discipline and arriving at very similar findings. I'd just like to echo uh, one of your arguments that says we need to better understand which are the dimensions and uh, preconditions of wisdom that go up and which go down with age. Uh, we have done similar things in our work and found that if we control for openness to new experiences or dogmatism or f indicators of fluid intelligence, we actually get a positive age gradient rather mm -hmm. than a zero. And so that is very much echoing on what you had um, described with your language characteristics. Mm -hmm. And I would like to mention one other finding. Um, just 
point, and that is that, um, so we've analyzed these data in a number of different ways, and one of the ways that we analyzed the age effect was looked at relative age. So how much older was the speaker than the listener? And in that analysis, when we looked at the individual dimensions, we found that all of them showed a slight non-significant decline with age, except for our fourth dimension, which was sensitivity to uh, the feelings of others, the closest we got to that affective dimension. And that one went up with age. So as the speakers, the, the more older the speakers were than the, the judges, the more they were perceived to be sensitive to the feelings of others. I was curious, what sense did you have that your participants were aware that they were assessing wisdom per se as a, as a total construct as opposed to just these individual dimensions and do you think the results might have differed if you sort of made, if you said simply how wise are these speakers, you know, sort of tapping into that stereotype? Yeah, uh, it was our intention that we not have them be aware that it was wisdom that we were assessing. So we took this very implicit approach, and that's partly why we broke it down into the different dimensions. However, um, partly because of the way our IRB works and, and some oversights on our part, the title in the consent form was Defining Wisdom or something like that. <laughs> so, um, I th and I think it was in, the word was in the recruitment materials as well. So, um, th so there was certainly some sense that I'm sure they had some sense that they were judging wisdom, aspects of wisdom, yeah. Uh, again. Just a detailed question. Um, you presented three tasks you showed us and you aggregated across the tasks. Is that what you did? We have looked at them separately, but yes, on these I'm, data, yes. All right, because I noted that there was one task that had a clear moral dilemma Mm -hmm. aspect to it uh, with the crime, which the other two didn't have. So I would expect, based on our earlier work, that you see slightly different patterns there. We saw, we found that our third narrative, which was autobiographical, showed the most difference from the other two. But the second task, the moral dilemma, showed more uh, gender differences. Uh, well they were all different from each other in, tr in terms of gender. So for example, the first one was the advice giving task um, about the young girl moving out of her house. And in that one, we found that women were judged much, much higher than men as on the wisdom dimension. They were judged to be wiser in their responses. And so I think that's another aspect of the interaction between the, the particular context in which wisdom is being judged and, the, and characteristics of the of the wise individual. Um, yeah. Do you think it's the underlying characteristics of um, old age speaking that's um, related to perceived wisdom or is it just age stereotypes per se? So if an old person starts talking like a young person or a young person starts talking like an old person, do you think the your results will still hold, or would it follow the age-related stereotypes if you already know the age of the person? Uh, that's an interesting question. I guess it depends what you mean by talking like a young person and, and whether or not it was sounded real, or whether they could pull it off. So if you're thinking about somebody with, uh, with strong age cues in their voice who starts to use young slang, that could backfire, I would, I would imagine. <laughs> I had a both for your talk and wait, wait, wait. the previous one. one thing I, I have, wait, wait, for the microphone, because otherwise we will not get into this. I want to be quick because I don't want to appear old. Uh, <laughs> in, in both of these talks, I had a, a, a broad set of cultural wonderments. In the first, I wonder, does it make a difference which two languages? Uh, and I say that because over the course of time, Latin, mm -hmm. Spanish, English, French have all been 
the language of imperial or colonial power. And to know your native language and to know one of those, uh, let's say in Iraq, is quite different, I should think, from knowing two uh, languages of parody. Uh, in this case, I wonder culturally, does it matter what the gen general sensibility of a society is toward aging and toward gender in the way identical questions and commentary are heard? I think those are at least analogous questions. Yeah. Well, I'll address the second one. <laughs> Albert can address the first one if he wants to, but uh, I, so we didn't start off with any expectations about gender effects or the uh, effects of the specific topic of the narratives, but the results that we got suggest that I'm sure those would be um, susceptible to cultural influences. Yeah, I would think absolutely. Um, following on from Clark's question, even within one language, I'm sure you'd get enormous variability if you uh, studied social class, regional accent, uh, in both readers and judges. Um, you know, people with non-BBC accents <laughs> would be mm -hmm. perceived as less wise than those who have them. Yeah, I'm, I'm not really qualified to answer that. Maybe somebody in the audience is better qualified, but I don't think in America those influences are, would be as strong as they might be in, <laughs> really? So, social class? <laughs> yeah, the sociophonology is that northern accents are perceived across the country as being more intelligent and southern accents mm. are perceived across the country as being friendly. But in Iowa... Well, we're right in the middle, so I... <laughs> plus I'm Canadian, not Iowan, so I don't know. 